This is Rush Hour, and we have an action-packed Minnesota Timberwolves draft show awaiting. I'm here joined by my trusty co-host, Drew the Commish Carter. Thank you so much, Austin. Kyle, our NHL insider, Kinnaman. He'll be joining us in a little bit, see what he has to say about the NBA draft as well. Boys, Carl Anthony Towns. It does not get much better than that. Oh, my Lord. I, I, I couldn't really be more excited. We nailed the pick. I shouldn't say we nailed it. We didn't screw it up, which is more than you can usually say about Minnesota sports teams. But I'm just so happy. When we announced that pick, I screamed. Everyone in Minnesota screamed because this guy is going to be so good. He's not going to bust. He's number one overall pick. They usually don't bust. Uh, Kyle was saying earlier that... Only two out of the last eight uh, first overall draft picks have busted in Greg Oden and Anthony Bennett. Exactly. Luckily, we have one of them. (laughs) But we don't have two of them because Carl Anthony Towns is not going to be one of them, and I truly believe that because he's so good. I mean, there's nothing this guy can't do. Exactly. When in his high school career, he led his team with 127 threes over 94 games. Bingo. But then when he went to Kentucky, Coach Cal said, I'm not going to do that here. You're going to stay down low. Exactly. Taught him how to play down low, was very efficient, great two way player. I mean, what else can you ask for? This is exactly what the Timberwolves have been needing. For years now, I mean, we uh-huh. we all know Pekovic can't play defense. <laughs> no, or, we cannot. We, we, we need that defensive side on the ball, and that is exactly what he brings. Right. He's he's so versatile, like you said. I mean, okay, here's here's how I see him. He's like a Frankenstein NBA center. I see him as 50% DeAndre Jordan slash Tyson Chandler. He will protect the rim on defense, run pick and roll, and dive to the rim, and catch lobs, and be cutting to the basket, get those passes from Ricky Rubio, and just jam it home. 50% Serge Ibaka slash Larry Sanders. Weak side help blocking shots with that huge body and long arms. Thank you for making that point. I was going to bring that up later, the Serge Ibaka effect. 50% Channing Fry run pick and pop and drain those threes. Yes, I know that adds up to 100, 150%, <laughs> and that does not make mathematical sense, but that's how much I love this guy because he's so good and he can do everything well on the basketball floor, and that's why I'm happy we drafted him, as opposed to Jaleel Okafor, who can't even play one side of the floor right now. Correct. No, he cannot. Could he develop into a good defensive player or even average? Maybe. And we know he's going to be a beast in the low post, probably average 20 points in his first season. But Carl Anthony Towns could do that too. And he can do that in multiple ways on the offensive end, which will open up the floor. And we know he's going to be a good on defense too because that's what that's what his calling card was coming into the draft. You need to bring up, um, when you bring up Okafor, his free throws. He was right. a 56% free throw shooter. And Towns, last year, was an 80-plus Free throw, eighty plus exactly. percentage. Ever being a big shooter. man when you get fouled that often down on the post, uh-huh. that's incredibly beneficial to uh-huh. have. Yeah, you don't so, want a Dwight Howard or a Shaq right. out there at the you free don't, throw line. You don't want the hack of Shaq used against you. No. Plus, um, we we like you said, he didn't shoot that many threes at Kentucky because Calipari forced him to go down low. Uh, at the Nike Hoop Summit when he was coming out of high school, all he did was shoot threes, and he wasn't able to do that in college because they didn't need him to, and Calipari wouldn't let him. So he developed that low post game. He's no longer afraid to go down there near the rim. And so now he can do it all. It's kind of like when Anthony Davis was in high school, or before high school, he played point guard. And then he grew a ton in high school and emerged into this guy who would be a number one pick. And now he's 6'11 and can handle the ball like a guard. I heard Flip Saunders say today um, about Towns that when you see him warm up, you're going to think his ball handling skills as a point guard, but then you realize that he's a center or a power forward. Exactly. And it's, it's so perfect for, I mean... Right now, modern NBA is kind of a buzzword and the changing way that teams play. But we just saw the Warriors win the championship with five guys who can shoot and space the floor and switch everything on defense. And Carl Anthony Towns is a seven-footer. He's not one of those 6'6 Swiss Army knives that a Draymond Green or Sean Livingston is or an Andre Iguodala. But the point is the same. is he, can, he, he has gravity on offense, meaning that people cannot help off of him because he's standing at the three-point line. No matter where he is, you always have to be guarding him. So Wiggins isn't going to get doubled in the post. Rubio's not going to have another eyes, another set of eyes watching him because they have to be watching Towns no matter where he is on the floor. He's a floor spacer. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you talked about the free throws because he didn't shoot that many threes at Kentucky, but we know he's going to be a good shooter because of the free throws. Historically, free throw percentage is a better indicator of NBA three-point success than actual three-point success in college because the sample size is so small when they're shooting threes in college. And I think Okafor... I mean, he could develop a good jump shot, but Towns already has it. I just feel exactly. like that doesn't help us if we ever draft. Like, if we did draft Okafor, like mm-hmm. we need that defensive presence, like mm-hmm. you were saying. Exactly. Having another shooter is not going to help us out. We already got Wiggins, uh, Levine, Kmart, all these players. Yeah. 
having another offensive president isn't going to really help us. You need the defensive thing because Peck can't do it. I also like the fact that you guys brought up that when he's warming up, he looks like a point guard. Uh, Sports Science had their fun with him and brought yep. him in. Uh, Towns, actually, he maintains 2.67 dribbles per second, which is right up there with James Harden. Mm-hmm. James beautiful. Harden. It's beautiful it's, to watch. That's the MVP runner-up right there, boys. So, uh-huh. I mean, um, he's second. Um, his release from the three-point line is half a second. He's got a quick shot. Right. So, And he hits it. Yeah. When it's, he was down there out, um, on Sports Science, once he got into his group, they said he had nine in a row. He went, uh, yeah. I <laughs> yeah. think... 13 of 15. And yeah, he said yeah. with his defense on there that if you have to shoot over him, it's like shooting over a house. It's yeah. 12 and a half, 12 and a yeah. half feet. Mm-hmm. And he, how fast he can get from each uh, side of the court, I don't remember the number that they said, but it was incredibly fast. Bingo, right there. Getting from one side of the court to the other is exactly why I love him so much. It's just one of the reasons why I love him so much. Because if you compare him to Jaleel Lokafor, Towns is much more athletic. I mean, you just look at the two guys. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. He's, his body is beautiful. Like, I'd... <laughs> His anatomy is amazing. The guy, the guy just looks incredible, and he's so fast, and he runs like a gazelle from one side of the floor to the other. Think about the Wolves in the future. You got Towns getting a defensive rebound, outlet pass to Rubio. Rubio with that amazing vision that may be unmatched in the NBA today. He's dribbling up the floor. Wiggins is running. Towns is running. Kmart spotting up. It's just going to be gorgeous. And I think we, as as a team, the Wolves should aim to be top ten in the league in steals plus blocks and top ten in fast break points. I think that has that's to be very our reasonable. That's to be our identity. Rubio um, was right up there with you know three, sometimes four steals a game. Yeah, mm-hmm. which was great. And Wiggins, um, we know Wiggins is a great perimeter. Exactly. Defender. And I don't know if this is just me, but with Rubio, like everyone thinks now you need the point guard like Westbrook and all these guys that are the giant scorers and whatnot. But Rubio. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have all these scores around. Right. You have Wiggins, you have Levine, Kmart, Towns now, mm-hmm. uh, KG when he's out there. Yeah. So like, you need him to just do what you said with the vision. Yeah, I'm I'm not ready to give up on Rubio yet. No, I know, he's 24. I, I, know plenty, I know. I know. Plenty of people are so ready to give up on the guy. You see, the thing um, about Rubio is he never had the confidence to shoot the ball. And last year, when he was healthy before that whole injury. He had found his confidence, and he was taking more shots that mm-hmm. he would have never taken two, three, four years ago. Right. And he was hitting those three-point shots for a while. And that is that is what we need him to do. Just keep shooting the ball, and they're going to drop. Because, I mean, when you got Carl Anthony Towns down there or even KG, you got guys who can rebound and outlet pass for the um, second, second try points. Plus, plus, even if Rubio doesn't develop and do a great jump shooter, Towns lessens that blow. Because your point guard can't shoot, but now your center can't. Exactly. And you know Flip Saunders loves to post up Andrew Wiggins on the block. People are going to sag off Rubio because they're not afraid of him shooting. They're not going to sag off Towns. So it's basically a trade-off. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not worried about our spacing anymore because now we have a guy at the five who can shoot so well. And that brings me to another point, which is I hope Flip Saunders uses him correctly. I hope he doesn't try to slot him in at power forward and play him next to <laughs> Pekovic. Because when you put him at the four, the impact of his shooting is just lessened dramatically yep. and um no i don't think he'll use him at the four i think that's mostly i just i just hope so because i feel like flip saunders is stuck in the 1990s no i think he he'll listen i feel like kg will have a lot of input mm-hmm. on it i mean you want shabazz playing the four or the three right you, you want know. shabazz somewhere two through four it doesn't yeah matter. exactly and so you're gonna want that out there with wiggins you want those two out there and then let towns go out there and maybe give a little bit of development with them. I know mm-hmm. one of you don't like that, doesn't like that word development, but no, no. It's just because we've been uh, using it for eleven years. That's just that's just what happens with a uh, disgruntled wolves fans mm-hmm. when, we, when we talk about development. But I, I mean, honestly, like I can't I can't say enough about Carl Anthony Towns and how excited I am about him. It's just gonna be awesome. What do you think about Tyus Jones? Right, Carl Anthony Towns was not the only guy the wolves got last night. Pulling a little Rick Spielman action <laughs> if you want to bring in the Vikings to this and get uh, multiple first round draft picks. Well, Flip said that after um, Carl Anthony Towns was taken, he was right back in right back in the draft room mm-hmm. trying to get Tyus Jones, and he wanted him from the very beginning. Yep. Um, he said before about three minutes before the Cav Cavaliers actually took him, they reached a deal with them to. Um, take Tyus Jones and give up our 31st and 36th pick. Yeah. Which is, I like the kid. I mean, it's a good move, I think. 
I mean, he's a hometown guy. Yeah. You know, your player of the year for uh, NCAA tournament. Yeah. I, I mean, I generally like the idea of trading two, fir- or tr- two second rounders to get back in the first round. Mm-hmm. But if we're going to trade up to 24, I would have preferred a guy named RJ Hunter out of Georgia State. I was telling, I told Rush this probably five times. I'm like, can we just get RJ Hunter, please? He's so good. I think he's going to be a beast in the pros. Yeah, too. We ended up taking Tyus Jones, which scares me because any time you try to bring in a guy just because he's from here. But he's it, won it ev- so far at every exactly, level he's done. In, exactly. He, I'm not saying he's freshman a Freshman at Duke prospect. and wins the national title. So yeah. it's. So I, I would just, I would prefer it to be more of a coincidence that he's, that this is his hometown rather than the reason we go get a guy because I think you run into problems with that. Uh, for example, when the Pacers traded uh, Kawhi Leonard for George Hill, one of the reasons was because George Hill went to IUPUI, is from Indiana. How'd that work out? <laughs> not very well, not quite Leonard's a beast. Uh, and, I mean, I don't know, Tyus Jones, I, I still don't really know how I feel about the guy as an NBA prospect. And for sure, he's going to be a backup point guard. Oh, yeah. I mean, I still think Levine is going to be the go-to option um, once Rubio... Yeah. He's d- done playing for a couple minutes. Yeah, but um, bench. You know, you can't flake on Zach Levine. A lot of people are saying he's not oh. a backup point, point guard. The kid's 19 years old, and his athleticism is absolutely through the roof. I mean, he's got a, a 40-plus inch vertical. Do you think he works better at the two? Than I the mean... One? Like, I see him more of a shooting guard, but that's just me. I can see him playing some point, but now that you have Tyus and Rubio, I think he's more to be used as a two coming off the bench. Well, it, we'll definitely have to see what Flip has in mind because, I mean, you could you could play these kids wherever. Like I said, yeah. they're 20 years old and they have all the athleticism in the world. And Flip's mind is he's an offensive mind. He loves to get the offense rolling. So, I don't know. We'll see. I We'll see. I mean, did you guys like the comments that Flip had about uh, back to Towns real quick where he was saying that, not to compare him to KG, but... Since 95, he has not seen a better individual workout than KG's. Oh. Yeah, I, <laughs> Towns, you hear stories about the workout. He was just training three after three, and these scouts are like, oh, my God, where did this come from? Mm-hmm. Like, I never saw this guy do this at college, and now, he, now he's doing it. I want to touch a um, little bit more on Towns' defensive side just so you guys can really understand. Um, his defendable area is equivalent to 130 square feet on, on the court. That's a that's, that's a large, large area. That is a very large area for one for one human. Yes, I mean, there's great success in his defensive game. Um, his defending air range is four percent bigger than the 2014 Defensive Player of the Year, Joakim Noah. Exactly. That's a big name for the in the defensive world. Right, and I think our biggest need was rim protection. We were the worst team in the league at protecting the rim last year. There, there are multiple stats to support that. We only corralled seventy one point six percent of uh, rebounds, which you mm-hmm. know, in turn, second chance points for the opponent. Yeah, and then if we if we can corral those rebounds, we can get in transition, like I said, because I think that's where our youth and athleticism is going to really pay off. Not to mention our league's worst sixty nine percent around the rim. Exactly. Which we gave up. Um, exactly. That's why we need Towns instead of Okafor. I definitely Towns is gonna bring up our number from the thirtieth ranked defense last year. Um, hopefully he brings up the offense mm-hmm. ranking too, which we were twenty fifth last season. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> last year we, it was not a good season. Clearly. When you're bottom five in both offense and defense, I mean, <laughs> it's obviously not a good combination. No. Oh my gosh. I mean, for myself as a just a casual basketball fan and a casual Timberwolves fan, yeah. I have never been more excited to watch Timberwolves basketball. Right. Because just from everything I've seen on Twitter from the T-Wolves, I know that's probably just uh, marketing, but it seems that all of these young guys have bought into the idea of growing together mm-hmm. and not being fed up with losing and wanting to get out of there as yeah. soon as possible. They've all bought into the idea of let's grow as a team and then – one day, eventually, if you, if it works out, obviously, then we will be amazing. Mm-hmm. And just hearing that makes you want to watch. Yeah, and it's it's so refreshing to see young guys like that, especially in Minnesota, mm-hmm. where guys a lot of the times don't want to be here. I'm and he said he general. wants to be here. Yeah, he yeah. just bought an apartment here apparently mm-hmm. today and is staying here all summer because he said this is where the push for the playoffs starts. I th- just hearing that is just at the at the draft party. Flip called him on stage. Yeah, and 
Flip goes, Carl Anthony, you got a message for these fans here? We're going to the playoffs, baby. <laughs> that just gives you chills right there. Oh, my God. And initially, what he said, um, after being on stage with Adam Silver, um, he said, I want team success. I'm here to bring the team exactly. success. Mm-hmm. And he didn't, me- he's like, I'm not here for solo success. Success. I really want to be here so we can get this team to the playoffs. Like, yeah. that's huge. You want to hear that. Think, just just envision this on the floor. Think about this, man. You got Ricky Rubio, you run a run, one five pick and roll with Towns. Rubio sees him with that great vision, great passing, gets it to him, run into the rim, he dunks. You run a 2-5 pick and roll with Kevin Martin. You go into that screen, Kevin Martin's going to splash a three in your face. You try to go around it, Towns is open on the roll. A 3-5 pick and roll, Wiggins, you get a mismatch. Either one of those guys can do damage in the post, and they're both just dynamic athletes. I mean, so right now, who's your preferred starting five? Uh, right now, I'd go Ricky, Kmart, Wiggins, Shabazz? Towns. Towns at the five. At the four, no, I want Shabazz as a micro guy off the bench. Okay. Ooh, at the like four, that. I'm tempted... I'm tempted to say Gorgie. Ooh. I'm tempted. Or pa- what about Payne? Can Payne play the four? Payne, I've, I've never really liked Payne. I've never been like a fan Payne. of his. Because it, you watch the guy play, it's just, I hate to be the body language doctor. I hate to be Bill Simmons. <laughs> but the guy plays, and it's just like he doesn't want to be out there. He's yelling at his teammates, and he's sulking, and it's like he thinks he's he was the first overall pick, and he deserves, he's like entitled to this respect that he just hasn't earned yet. I mean, the guy's athletic. He's crazy. He... Has upside, obviously. I've just never really liked him as a player. You so guys can disagree. So you'd put point. Dang at four. I don't know. I mean, I think we're. I'm. This is why I'm not the coach. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I'm just saying, like, just as a fan, like you, most fans have a preferred I, lineup right. in every sport. I think, I think Shabazz might actually fit best, and I'm glad I'd, that you brought that up. I'd prefer Shabazz because, and Wiggins out there because together. I want as much floor spacing as possible. Because we just saw the Warriors win a championship playing like that. But I do want his scoring off the bench. And I'm not a big Levine fan. You guys, you guys were arguing if you want him at the one or the two. Here's why I want him: the bench or on another <laughs> team. I think he's so overrated in Minnesota just because he has a 40 inch vertical, like Rush said. I think he's, his advanced stats he's last 20 year. 20 years his old. His stats like, last year were literally some of the worst ever. Some of the worst ever. He's so inefficient on a team with the 25th right. ranked offense and the 30th and ranked that's, defense. That's, so you can't bring up bad that's, stats. That's the counter. That's the counter. It's the guy was put in a bad situation and he made the most of it pretty much. He he had some impressive games towards the end. So, I mean, I love Zach Levine. I love his personality. but And how I, he wants to still be here. Yeah, so no, what, he what if he wows been. you this year? Well, then I'll be happier than anyone. <laughs> I'm just skeptical that he's going to turn into this all-star because he can jump high. That's all I'm saying. So I wouldn't start him either. I wouldn't start Levine. I think for now he's a bench player and comes off. I, for some... I, Drew Cart, if I were the coach, I'd start four players. Four players, yeah, no power. Wow. We don't need one. <laughs> well, you heard it here first. <laughs> oh, and dear lord. And by the way, uh, going back to Tyus Jones, um, I just found this stat here that I love because we talked about the transition and how that needs to be our identity. Tyus Jones ranked eighth best in college basketball with seven point five points per game in transition last season. So he fits right in. He comes off the bench. He can do that. He plays the two. He can do that. Maybe he's our starting shooting guard. Here's another stat for you. Tyus' assist to turnover ratio was 5.6 to 1.9. That's pretty good. That is very good. All right, boys. He's a knockdown free throw shooter, and he also shot 38% from the three. So I think overall, our draft night. Right. All right, so we're pumped about our draft. So you two, what do you think about the rest of the draft? Um, Um, Would you want to just go down the line? Yeah, absolutely. I got it right here. Um, D'Angelo Russell at the two. I love this move. I know you wanted Okafor to go to the Sixers really bad. Or was that you? One of you? I think it was both of us. To I mean, you both did just wanted Okafor to drop to the Sixers. I, I mean, I'm on board with taking Russell over Okafor. I don't think yeah. there's really an argument there. You need, well, I guess there is an argument. But remember they drafted last year Julius Randle, who mm-hmm. missed the entire season? I don't really think he fits with Okafor on offense because they pretty much do the same thing. Neither one of them plays much defense. And you need D'Angelo Russell in the backcourt. They have Clarkson and Kobe, obviously. Kobe's not going to be there much longer. Mm-hmm. No. And so if you have a young, promising backcourt of Clarkson and Russell, that's nice. That's something you can give your fans hope about. For the advanced analytics, which I know we're all big fans of here, mm-hmm. um, he's got the highest ceiling to become a superstar in the league. Which I don't know how you don't, measure, but okay. apparently you can. You know he also has the highest bus potential. He does, yes, it's, he does. I'm so sick of hearing that because... Um, I, I, you can't quantify. If we could quantify that, the draft would be no fun. No, exactly. And the NBA would be no fun. 
because we know it would happen. But I see where they're coming from because the guy, his upside, he's been compared to James Harden. His downside, he's been compared to a guy who has only one hand and can do anything with his right and plays no defense and is selfish and is overly confident. But I like the guy. I mean, I think he's I think he's a pretty special player. I mean, the Lakers kind of needed a point guard. Who was their starting one last year? Jeremy Lin. Well, Clarkson... Clarkson developed and flashed a little bit last mm-hmm. year. Yeah, but that's I think that might be a little bit of a mirage because he was the only one there, so he had to score mm-hmm. and he had to facilitate. Um, I'm I don't know. I they're both they're both pretty promising. We'll say that. Number three going to the 76ers out of Duke, Jaleel Okafor. <laughs> 76ers man, they're just all about the assets. Because Okafor, three big men makes sense. Well. They're there's no way that all three of them are there in what two years? No, there's no way because you can't spend those those crucial picks on guys like that and then not be able to play them together. Um, Who are the three you're speaking of? Just uh, Noel, I know Noel, and then Embiid. Okay, because who Embi- might not play this year? Right, and that's the thing. Embiid, if he's a complete bust, if he's Greg Oden, or if he can never play again, <laughs> then they need Okafor. But that's just so disappointing for Sixers fans. I think. Thank God we don't live in Philly. <sighs> a lot of disappointment there. At least there. we have an upside right now. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting pick out of New York for the Knicks. Chris Stapps Porzingis. Poor I feel awful for this guy. You know, this is supposed to be so bad. the best day of your life. Dream and the, realized. And, you, and the entire arena booed this guy. It's so pathetic. It is. It makes me sick. Those Knicks fans... Are ridiculous. What makes They're not entitled to anything. Yeah. They boo the guy because he's tall and white, and they've seen international players fail before because they had Andrea Bargnani on their team last year. I think what makes me the most sick, or sick is Melo's response. Melo I can sit down. I know. It's the fact that your star player came out publicly and disagreed with your number four overall pick. Yeah. Like, you're came. supposed to congratulate him for being there, like what Ricky did mm-hmm. with that, uh, with, with Towns. Yeah. Funny tweet. Ready yeah. to pick up my dry, dry cleaning? cleaning? That was like, funny. Just, I would hate to be this kid right now. You have an entire fan base that pretty much just booed you. The only people that are supporting you are Phil Jackson. And, and I... The star player is going to hate you already. And I have a question for Knicks fans. Who did you want them to draft? At that point, there was no one with higher upside or even close, in my opinion. <laughs> I think he was... The best player on the board by far. I think he's going to be really good. But what might hinder his development is everyone in his city hating him and him getting booed. His first experience with the Knicks is getting booed on draft night on national TV and getting embarrassed. And how can they, if they want their team to do well, maybe they can try to instill some confidence in their future. I mean, and who did Melo want? Right. Like uh, Stephen A. Smith is complaining on ESPN about how they should have drafted Justice Winslow. That would have been a reach. If, if they had drafted Justice Winslow, then smart NBA people would be saying that they that was too high for him. Mm-hmm. Chris Stapps Porzingis, every NBA, every NBA scout and general manager says this guy had huge upside and deserved to be a top five pick. And I think he does. Mm-hmm. Because he has, he has potential to be Dirk Nowitzki on one end and a rim protector on the other end. That doesn't come around that often. Mm-mm. And just because he's tall and white and comes from Latvia, people haven't seen him play, they hate him. Yeah, because they didn't see him play in college. Right. If he if he had played in college, no one would be no one would have booed that. Mm-mm. Not at all. He also played in the second best league outside of the yeah. NBA. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, love that point. He was playing against players who were better than the ones in college. Yes. And he's his stats weren't amazing. I mean, he averaged like eleven and five, but he didn't play. But that he many. wasn't playing in a bum right. league he over in Italy. He like, didn't play that many come minutes. On. He played a slow pace. And so his stats aren't going to be that good. I think he was very impressive last year, more impressive than pretty much anyone in college. So I, I loved the pick, but I, I just my heart hurts for that guy yeah, because yeah. his dream was realized and everyone hates him already, and it's just so unfair. It's just it's, it's very sad. It's Phil Jackson. He sees something and he's done in the past. So. I mean, yeah, you have to put your faith, and I understand Knicks fans are impatient. They're usually in the playoffs and whatnot or mm-hmm. contending to be in the playoffs. But this man has eleven championships. Yeah. You, you, you need to put your faith in him. Like he's and, obviously done something right yeah. in his career to and, win eleven championships. And people are saying that they needed to draft a guy who could help them next year. What? Porzingis will. Phil said he's five years away, which I think is wrong. I think I he's heard two, two to three. Two or three, exactly. That's what I would say. 
And so you want to draft a guy who's going to help you next year? What, Justice Winslow could take you from 20 wins to 21 wins? Is that really that important? Or are you going to take a guy named Christos Porzingis who could turn into an MVP caliber player one day? Mm -hmm. I honestly believe that's how good he can be if he reaches his ceiling. So (laughs) it it just frustrates me. But I don't care because the Knicks fans, I like to laugh at them. The kid who was Don't crying, we all? The kid who was crying while taking a selfie. Yeah, it's sad for him, but it's still hilarious because it's the Knicks. I think he needs to put the phone down and stop <laughs> documenting that. Yeah. All right. We have Mario Hizonia, another international player, mm-hmm. uh, going to the Orlando Magic. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about this one either. I think it's a nice fit. Uh, he can slide into the small forward immediately, and they have that backcourt of Peyton and Oladipo. I probably would have taken Moutier because I just think he's a better prospect overall. And even though he doesn't really fit with Peyton, I think if you're looking maybe five, ten years down the road, which is what you want these guys to be, because you're using such a high pick on them, you expect them to be your future. Maybe Peyton's not there anymore, and then you feel bad about taking, you feel bad about passing on a point guard who mm-hmm. could be really good one day. Uh, just to wrap things up in the NBA draft of last night, uh, a couple of picks that I liked were Justice Winslow going to the Heat, which was mm-hmm. a steal. With yeah, I agree with that. And I like I when I was comparing Winslow and Porzingis, like I said I like Porzingis better, but that doesn't mean I think Winslow at 10 is a bad pick by any means. That was a steal. I like Sam Decker going to the Rockets, which is a, a shooter's, shooter's team. Right, yeah. We all know team. he's a shooter. That's, yeah, that's another value pick. And then also, one pick before going to the Bucks, you got to give it up for uh, hometown guy Rashad Vaughn, making his dreams come true. So Cool to see that. That was very cool. We're going to move on to the NHL draft, which is tonight. Our Ooh. NHL insider's got a few words he would love to say. Oh, well, first things first, today, day of the draft, mm-hmm. we've got a ton of trades going on. <laughs> Woke up this morning, and the Senators have traded Legwand uh, and Leonard, and I believe a pick to the Sabres, which the Sabres needed a goaltender and uh, Leonard. Uh, yeah, Leonard. And then uh, Legwand, good, good forward. Mm-hmm. And then Eichel can join that and Vander Kane for good core. Um, then all of a sudden you see Lucic. I called it all day. I was talking to a Boston Bruin fan, one of mm-hmm. my friends, and he was saying, "What do we, ask? What we should do?" I'm like, "Just telling you right now, Lucic needs to be gone." Yeah. As soon as I say that, I get the update. Lucic has been traded the Kings, mm-hmm. and then the Boston Bruins also traded Dougie Hamilton, a very good young defenseman, to the uh, Calgary Flames yeah. for draft picks. So the Boston Bruins now have the 13th, 14th, and 15th pick in this draft. That's a solid trio. <laughs> <laughs> so they could try and trade two of those to get up to the third pick at Arizona, but Arizona has now said that unless someone blows them away, they're not giving away the third pick. Okay. Um, Just give them all three picks. For all three, you might you could have a chance at Eichel, but I doubt it. So speaking of that third pick, what do you think they're going to do with it? Um, I think they go Dylan Strome. Uh, Ford out of Erie. He played okay. behind Connor McDavid. He mm-hmm. actually had better numbers than Connor McDavid that year because mm-hmm. Connor McDavid went down with a hand injury after getting into a fight. Um, and then, or defenseman Noah Hannafin. Uh, yeah. And there's Pronov, or Pronovov, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, <laughs> Hannafin and Strom. Those uh, three are going to go three, four, five. No one knows what order. Because yeah. both, all the teams in that order need either a defenseman or a Ford. So it's just kind of going to be a checklist of which yeah. one goes where. Because the Leafs are at four. They need a defenseman, but they could also use Strom's offense. So, Col- or not Columbus, uh, Coyotes really have, like, the ball in their court right now for the rest of the draft. Um, right, because everyone knows the first two picks are going to be. They're pretty much It's going to go McDavid and Eichel. Yeah. So. Unless Edmonton just pulls an idiot move and is like, <laughs> we're going to draft Dylan Strom. <laughs> so, Would they so. be wrong to take Eichel? Um. You can't pass up on Connor McDavid. I think Eichel is going to be a very good player, but there's no way that you pass up Connor McDavid, who has the potential to be Sidney Crosby, mm-hmm. if not better. Right, that's what you hear. And so his numbers are very comparable to Sidney Crosby. You kind of have to go with Connor McDavid. I, I guarantee he goes one. Eichel goes two. From there on, it's who knows. I personally thought Columbus was going to trade up to the third pick. Reports said that they're going to trade the eighth pick, mm-hmm. uh, Anisimov and Reichel, um, to Arizona. And so Arizona will only drop to the eighth, which isn't that bad. You get a good Ford, and I believe Reichel's also a Ford. So you get two good players and the eighth overall pick to give up for that. And they could draft 
Columbus could then draft Strom for a winger, which they need to get that playoff push. Mm-hmm. Or they could draft for Hannafin and then have a good young top pair defenseman with Jack Johnson and Noah Hannafin. So, I don't know. I think Arizona keeps it based off of reports I've seen today. Mm-hmm. But, if anything, I think Columbus gets it. Winnipeg was in there, but Winnipeg's not going to give up their core for it because they were in the playoffs this year. Yeah. Um, and then the Wild. The Wild had the 20th pick this year. And I heard Chuck Fletcher say... Like their way of drafting is so methodical, so the NHL called it. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the way they do it is just they have a checklist of thirty players. Whoever goes, they cross them out and they get the top one left. Yeah. And so it, there's no debate at the table, none of that, which is good to see. The draft goes very fast. The NHL draft is one of the fastest drafts I watch. And uh, the NFL, I'm just like, my God, keep going. <laughs> NHL, there's like five picks done. Yeah. Um, and then in non-related draft news just with the Wild in general. Right now, they are close to signing deals with uh, Granlund. Uh, they're on the last half of the stretch, just mm-hmm. figuring out numbers. And then Masterson Trophy winner Devin Dubnik. So That needs to happen. That will happen. They're, Dubnik wants to be here. Well, him and Fletcher were in Vegas the other the other night talking up a storm. Yeah, I heard they were good talks, which is a good sign. Oh, they both said that they want to. Well, <coughs> Dubnik said he wants to be here, and Chuck says he wants him here. It's a matter of figuring out the numbers. I hope it's also a matter of figuring out the years. He yeah. wants his party wants five years, and Fletcher is a hundred percent right in saying we can't give you five years. Yeah, we can't. We absolutely cannot. Um, we just gotta hope he's not kind of the one hit wonder goalie, the one year wonder, where half a year, well, half a year wonder. <laughs> so, but I mean, he was a first overall draft pick, not first overall, I mean first round draft pick. So he does 2004. have two thousand four, but there was potential from the start. Um. And then the, this morning, the Wild made headlines by signing top free agent and former Gopher defenseman Mike Riley. Um, and per sources, well, now it's official, but it was down to Blackhawks, Penguins, and Wild. And you think of the Penguins and Blackhawks, you think Sidney Crosby, Jonathan Days, Patrick Kane, Cups, right? Yeah. And he chose to come to here, even though he's from Chicago as well, which is kind of yeah interesting to see. Um, and that makes our defense even deeper, which is nice to see. I mean, we already were deep with defense with Suter, Brodeen, Scandella, Spurgeon, Dumba, Leopold, Prosser, Ballard. Like, the list goes on. So... <laughs> is that it? <laughs> well, Ballard's out with concussion issues from all the way back against the Islanders. Okay. So, really, I now think that this makes Nate Prosser expendable, and I could see him in the AHL or out of here. We put him on waivers last year, he went to the Blues, and then they put him on waivers, and then we signed him back. Yeah. Um, but he's very good at the penalty kills, so I think they'll keep him, maybe. And then there's always the reports of Jared Spurgeon since the end of this year that he is now expendable with Matt Dumba showing that he can be basically Jared Spurgeon. They're both like 5'10". Dumba's so awesome. Both have amazing shots. Both play very similar play styles, so they didn't see a point really having two of them. Yeah. But Mike Riley... Ask Kevin Durant, Esquire, oh. the bill, and score half off your wireless rate plan. Call for free, that. 1-8-4-4. <laughs> um... But Mike Riley's 5'11", 156 pounds. So it's kind of like, what are they doing there? We don't really have that big defenseman except for Scandella and Brodeen because Suter's still kind of average. Mm-hmm. So now we have three small defensemen, but they've proven, well, Mike hasn't because he's been in mm-hmm. U of M. But, like, you've seen these small defensemen be able to prove it, but rumors have it Jared Spurgeon might be dealt to the Edmonton Oilers for a scoring winger, Neil Yakupov, who was a first overall draft pick. I would take Yakupov. So... Now that we have Riley, like, I love Jared Spurgeon. I don't want to see him gone. Mm-hmm. Him and Marco Scandell have been playing together since they were juniors. So mm-hmm. their chemistry is out of this world. They've always been on the, a defensive pair since 2009 or 2010. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to see Jared Spurgeon go, but now that we got Mike Riley, you can kind of go to that third line. Could go down into the AHL to start the season. That wouldn't be surprised. Um, and then you see Matt Dumba go up to the second line. And then Jared Spurgeon's out, and we finally get maybe that scoring winger. But I still think it's too early because Jason Zucker, if he didn't go down with that injury last year, he was a 20-goal scorer, and he missed a lot of the season. Mm -hmm. And so I think Jason Zucker could develop into that goal scorer we need. And Thomas Vanek in his second year, yeah, people call him lazy. He's only (laughs) 10 years (laughs) in his career. He scored 10 10 straight years of having 20-plus goals. Mm Mm-hmm. I think people are just tired of our goal scorers not performing in the playoffs. I mean, people were complaining in regular season about Thomas Vanek. 
I say he's lazy. He I'll, is lazy. I will, I'll back Thomas Vanek up in the regular season. I won't back him up or Pominville in the Jason postseason. Jason fans on every one timer I've ever seen. <laughs> Love the kid, but my God, Jason. I mean, those two need to be on the same line together. They're playing on the same team. I know. That's what I never understood. I thought immediately the line was going to be Thomas Vanek, Granlund, and Jason Pominville. I thought for sure because Pominville and Granlund had the chemistry from the year before, and then Pominville and Vanek had it. And Vanek, the stats have proven that when he has 200 minutes with the same line, he starts to produce. Mm-hmm. And so we need that. I think just in general, the Wilder got better with Riley. Yeah. Um, the draft, I don't know who we're gonna get. Jeez, there's it's, we're it's too so far obvious. down, yeah. mm-hmm. and so I think they they'll probably go with a forward. I mean, our defense is pretty much set for mm-hmm. the years to come. Suiter's our oldest right. one at 28, 29. The rest of them are twenty four and under, mm-hmm. except for Jordan Leopold. Obviously, he's like thirty eight, but he'll be more mm-hmm. of a mentor role to Matt Dumba. Yeah. Yeah. So Says here we're projected Timo Meyer, a left winger out of Halifax. I would not be surprised if we got him. I think that we need a winger. Uh, it's pretty sure he's a scoring left winger. Like he's not a a big power forward like a Nino Niederreiter or Charlie Coyle. So I think we need that kind of Jason Zucker type player. That's one thing we're missing is just that scoring. You look at all the elite teams in the cup. You have the Patrick Kane. You have the Jonathan Taves. The Patrick Sharps. Like of the Blackhawks, where they just score and they capitalize on the chances, and we have not had a player that can do that. I have a question. So you said the Wild basically just have a checklist and they go down and they take the best player available? Off of their checklist, Do you yeah. think, given all their defensive depth that you just went into, do you think that they would pass on a defenseman if he was the next best available? Um, it's hard to say because one thing, like I think defense wins championships. That's the motto I always go by. So you can never have too many good defensemen. Yeah. And, you know, let them go in the AHL for a bit. Obviously, or he might go play juniors if we draft an 18 year old, or he mm-hmm. might go to college. So, I wouldn't mind a defenseman, but I think the one thing we really need is a a winger. We're right. good with center depth right now, kind of. We I think we let Brodziak go. I mean, we bought out Matt Cook. Yeah. So God. we got rid of the checking line. <laughs> got rid of the dirty line. Yeah. So got rid then of the slash. let's see, Brodziak and uh, Matt Cook are gone. You got Ryan Carter still there. Who Ryan Carter's a great penalty killer. Mm-hmm. He can score if you need to, and he'll play his role. I think Eric Howla will play the fourth line center, and then that left wing on fourth line is kind of open. Justin Fontaine could take it, but so that's where you think we'll go. I think that's open for now. Okay. I think the top three lines are set, and then Ryan Carter set at the fourth line, and then someone might beat out Howla for the fourth line center, mm-hmm. but you never know. Howla, <laughs> you want to move over to MLB real quick? I would love to move over to the MLB real quick. Your Minnesota Twinkies. Taking on the Milwaukee Brewers tonight, Twins thirty nine and thirty three, uh, Milwaukee twenty seven and forty seven. Also going to be joined here by our technical director Greg Spath coming in and talk about the Twinks. Hey, thanks for having me on. What do you think about that last series? Bats finally broke even for thirty five oh, yeah. runs. That was good to see. It was. I mean, the Twins have been an impressive team. Probably, I think one of the most impressive teams in baseball this year. But. I've seen the bad side and the good thi- sides. I think this could be a wild card, if not the division championship team. The surprise, I think, you know, I think it could be the Royals, like, like the Royals from last year. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm thinking right now. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that really makes me think that is right now we don't have our best pitcher on the rock. Our best pitcher hasn't thrown a pitch yet. Which Urban is exciting. Santana. I wouldn't say he's our best pitcher. I think he's our best pitcher. He I mean, he's a, guy, a long time. <laughs> he's a guy that's going to give you 200 innings. He's probably going to be in the... Th- Right, he's gonna be in the three point ERA little category. Mm-hmm. I think that he could be the, the kick in the pants the Twins need to get to the playoffs. Maybe we'll see. Another team that I think, I mean, quickly bringing yeah. up. I mean, you brought up he could be our best pitcher. I mean, right now our best ERA is Mike Pelfrey with the. 3. I mean, who saw that coming though? Yeah, Mike so, Pelfrey. I, mean, I think that Santana could probably have an ERA lower than three point oh six. That's good, but I think. He has the potential to do it. So, yeah, Drew, mm-hmm. I think he could be our best pitcher out there. Maybe. I mean, he's he has a he has potential for a lot of strikeouts per game. Plus he's and got he's, the motivation mm-hmm. coming I mean, back. Yeah, I mean, our team's winning right now. I mean, that's a really enough motivation for almost anyone to come in halfway through the season. I mean, you also look at probably what I think. I think right now in the league there's a lot of good teams 
That's why we've seen a lot of like close races in the divisions this year. The two best teams in the league are in the same division in St. Louis and Pittsburgh. Yeah, I think right now one good team that I've seen the best team all year that I think is just a great team is the St. Louis Cardinals. They've been plagued with injuries, and yet yeah. they're still the best team in baseball. The they've got, they have. Yeah, is. they've got something going on there. Yeah. I mean, I watched them when the, they played the Twins. The Twins took two, and the Cardinals took two. Both at both at their home ballparks. Mm-hmm. I just noticed how the Cardinals never really gave up a game. I mean, it was a, a surprise when the Minnesota Twins hit a walk off home run. That was the first time this year that the Cardinals have had given up a lead after the seventh inning. Wow. And they're so good. <laughs> they're I just so good every year. They are. I, they just had a system. I mean, it's of course, fair. you have that little scandal that, you know, they were hacking the Astros' computer. By their hacking, you mean that they, one of their executives left and didn't change his password. Probably. He went That's to probably. the Astros and didn't change his password, and like, <laughs> let's try it, and it <laughs> happened to be the correct password. Spygate was a scandal. This is a whole nother, whole nother deal. They got mm-hmm. the FBI involved in this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, back to the Twins real quick. Mm-hmm. So, you were reading the article, and I think I read the same one, that we're buyers. Yeah this time of year yeah that's the first time in about four or five years since that's happened and i know they say we should get ryan howard which i disagree with who do you think we should get because right now our batting average leader is tory hunter with a 262 oh yeah we need someone that we need an average bat out there yeah oh that's a really hard thing to do i mean any rosario 356 well, yeah. How many games played? Not a lot of games played, but you know he's been a spark in the lineup. Eddie Rosario. I mean, he has been a guy that has been not talked about. You have like Miguel Sano, who's been hot inside of Double A. You have Buxton being called up. No one's talking about Eddie Rosario. I mean, he's batting I mean, two eighty. That's because yeah, it, but, this is a kid who came up through our farm system and said, "This is where I need to be," and mm-hmm. he he let his bat do all the talking. And that's what I wish Hicks and Buxton were doing. I mean, can't Hicks talk and about Buxton. Buxton yet. Buxton's only had what nine games played. I understand that, but you gotta you gotta look at it. He's doing the exact same thing Hicks did. He's a tremendous outfielder, but he's swinging at every single ball. He struck out four times the other night. I think he's nervous right now. I mean, this isn't like something to be panicking right away. Breaking news! Oh wow! Oh, speaking of Byron, Byron Buxton, Buxton, out four to six weeks mm. with the left sprain. Oh no, that's not good. I mean, last year he was injured because of a concussion. He played like two games in Double A, got a concussion. Yep. This is that might be a reason to panic. No. <laughs> but as of for the development of Buxton and Hicks, you know, you look at Tory Hunter. I mean, he did the exact same thing Hicks did. He came up, had to go back down a couple times, and then came up and become became our starting center fielder, our star, all star, gold glover. Yeah. I mean, it just takes a little bit of time. People I think people are just used to like having results right away. Like you look at Mike Trout. They want him to be Mike Trout right now. But Mm -hmm. that's just not going to happen in everyone. People have to have time to develop. I mean, like you said with the Twins being possibly the Kansas City Royals of this year, I mean, like I... I mean, you look at our batting averages, no one's above 300 except for Nunez. He only has 29 games played. Yeah. So, like... But we're winning. Yeah, the re it's like <laughs> Which blows my mind. All of our averages are in the two hundreds or lower and we're winning somehow. We have to credit to the pitchers and, Finally. and the bullpen. We're not even pitching while well. you guys just said that. We're a lucky team. And I cannot disagree with you guys anymore. I think we're gonna regress the mean. I think we're gonna finish below five hundred. Wouldn't oh. be surprised if we lose ninety games. And I just ninety, 90 games? games there's no chance we're making wow. playoffs. I think we have a chance at the wild card. I think the division like is a stretch, but I mean, right now we're thirty nine and thirty three and second in the AL Central. You're saying that we're gonna lose sixty more games? Kyle, we agreed on the Anaheim Ducks and we said that their record in one goal games was a fluke, and they're a pretty lucky team, and they're not as good as their but record. But we're would out. But you can't. This is completely different. It's completely the same thing. No, because we are out scoring teams. No, we're not. There are multiple games where we've won Our run, eleven to two. You can use anecdotes like that with five games that you've watched this season but our run differential would say we're a below 500 team we're lucky we have cluster luck what happens is the reason we have guys batting 260 is our highest average and we're still winning is because of cluster luck and what that is is we might get three hits in a game but they're all in the same inning so we score a run and then our bullpen comes in and plays well i think our bullpen is the only above average part of our roster and the twins besides mike pelfrey who has at almost even three ERA. So we have one good starter. An ERA. We have a pretty, pretty, pretty Hughes good starter. Phil leading our team in the wins. You just it said that Irvin Santana was going to come back and be our best but starter. He has, he's not our best starter yet because he hasn't thrown a pitch. But right, he could that's be. what I'm saying. So I don't think he will be. I don't think he's good. I think our all of our players 
are not that good. Brian Dozier is our only above average hitter right now. And we're winning because of luck. Brian Dozier's better than yeah, 261. You guys choose to ignore the stats because you're Twins fans. I am looking at the stats. And it's it paints a picture of a team that cannot keep this they up. They said the same thing about the Royals last that's year. What, that's what the Royals did not hit any home runs. They said there's no chance they could make it to the World Series, even the playoffs. That and is, look what happened. That's a one-time thing. That's not. That could be a two. It's sports. Anything can happen. Exactly. But if you're trying to decide what's most likely to happen, I think it's that the Twins are overachieving right now. And is there a reason? What if they keep overachieving? They just... That's see, just, I see what that's you're just saying. That's unrealistic to expect that. But I see it what is you're saying, but also, they just keep winning. Like, I get what you're saying, but yet they haven't <laughs> lost yet. To you, gotta, you gotta see it from his side. I mean, Thank I, you, see, I see it from both sides. We I are, do see what you're saying. It seems unrealistic that a team that best hitter is batting 262 and their next best is 261, and then it drops off significantly. Like, I see that, and it's not a reason they should be winning, but they keep proving everyone wrong and winning. I know. There was a stretch where our bats did go cold, and I will... Bl- First of all, I thought this this was it. During That's that, what I thought. During, during that five-game losing streak, during yeah, five game losing streak I'm like, we had our fun, here comes the 90 losses. I mean, I don't know. It is it is scary. I mean, there's a lot of upside right now, but you got to look at what he's saying. I still think it's coming, and I am excited about our future. I think Buxton, Buxton is one of the only guys who's not overachieving right now. <laughs> he's he's like Rush said, he's obviously not batting very well. Buxton's um, batting one eighty nine, but yeah. he has so much of a potential. All you have to do is watch the guy run the bases to see how good he can be. I don't think he's batting one eighty nine. He is batting one eighty nine. He has seven hits and thirty seven at bats in eleven games played, with one double and one triple, and no home runs and no RBIs. And now he's not going to be back for a while. Yeah. So we're probably going to have Danny Santana playing center field, if not Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Rosario. Danny Santana's batting 218. Well, he hasn't Danny been San- up here. Danny Santana was a fluke last year. Okay. Mm. Well, moving on from that, um, let's let's talk about the A-Rod getting 3,000 hits and then all the backlash, you know, obviously from using steroids. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, I think... He's been on his best behavior. He said all the right things. All he cares about is winning. He has yet to talk about himself. Honestly, and I'm not a huge A Rod fan because of everything that he did. But I mean, you can't just hold a grudge. He's been doing all the right things. I mean, he's been hitting the ball well, mm-hmm. and and the thing is with the much- steroids. Like I've always been on the side of it's not good. Obviously, like it's a it hurts the game, but also you But can't. it's part of the game. It's part I mean, of the we game, need to exactly. get over it. Sure, uh, Barry Bonds, yeah, he has the most home runs ever, right? He mm-hmm. used steroids so that he still has to hit the ball. Yeah. A-Rod still had hit get a hit 3,000 times. It doesn't matter if steroids. That doesn't help his contact. Well, given it does a little because he has more power out of it, but, like, yeah. seeing the ball hit the bat, steroids and, don't help that. And A-Rod would have been an incredible player even without the steroids, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean... Like you look back when he first started, I mean, I mean, what he almost hit a home run on his first at bat. Mm-hmm. I mean, he showed incredible power even when he was just coming into the league. Yeah, and he was a shortstop at the time. You know, that was back in the day when shortstops hit more home runs, mm-hmm. and you know, second basemen hit more home runs than they do yeah. now. But you know, that was still an incredible kind of feat of power that he kind of showed in his first year. Yeah, I, I mean, do I think it's kind of the same talk that you have with Bonds? Do you think? that he would be the home run hitter that he became if not for steroids. Now, I think, you know, I don't think he would have hit as many home runs, but, you know, I still think he could have been a 400 home run guy. Maybe maybe hits 400, 500 instead of 600. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I... I don't know. I'm I come I'm kind of an A Rod fan right now. I mean, he's I, doing I every, he's too. doing all it's, the right things. Yeah. This, I think if this would have happened ten years ago when he was in his like selfish era mm-hmm. where everything was about him and being famous, he would have not had the same response to getting 3,000 hits of where he was talking about the team and whatnot. Yeah, I'm, it's because he's 39 years old or 38 and he's matured. I think the the reason we're all rooting for A-Rod is because pretty much everyone else is rooting against him, especially yeah. people in New York. And it's just, oh, yeah. it's just annoying. You could just him. tell the difference. I mean, he did it the same way as Derek Jeter, but you could tell the difference yeah. in hype. And like in the media in in New York, yeah, of the di- like just because A Rod t- took steroids. And the question is, what would have happened if that was on the road? Yeah. Oh yeah. no, that I don't know. That, that was an eight game stretch. That was I don't know. That was kind of a blessing, if you ask me. But 
Here's a here's another MLB thing. What do you guys think about the All Star voting? It's hilarious. That, I'm for it's... and against it. Like I like Ned Yost's response of then vote. Exactly. I love that response, but also I'm just like, you know what? You gotta have writing there. You can't have seven from the same team. But mm-hmm. if it was, it got to eight. At if one I was point, in Kansas yeah. City being a fan, I'd be like, yeah, we're the team. We voted. They deserve to be there. If you're gonna leave this up to the fans, the, we're the only ones that are voting. Yeah. I mean. But I don't. That's a hard thing to think about. I mean, Kansas City is a small market team. But the fans are crazier than. Everybody. That is true. Like I mean, it's because they're a bunch look, of Chiefs fans. You, you, yeah. <laughs> you look at guys like Omar Infante. I mean, he, he's, he's just a barely over two hundred average. He's I mean, very bad, actually. He's and not. he's going to be starting the All Star <laughs> yeah. game. Yeah. Something's got to be done about that. I, know, I agree. It's I the think robots. It's either it either has to be changed. One of the two has to be changed. Either fans can't vote, or it can't determine. World Series home field advantage, or you can't talk about it when you're talking about Hall of Fame cases. Because mm-hmm. if you say Omar Infante, look at him, he made the All Star team in 2015. That supports his Hall of Fame case. That's just absurd. Because I know that's just something. That yeah. I, yeah, I think it shouldn't be fan voted this much. Or it should be somewhat fan voted, considering it decides who has the seventh game in the World Series. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pro Bowl is completely different. NHL, yeah. M- M- NBA, it's all different because it's worth nothing. Yeah, I mean, this is the most important all-star game in sports. Yeah, I mean, it, this determines... Mm-hmm. This could maybe determine a World Series. Yeah, it could. And so voting Omar Infante in there isn't helping the AL in any sort. Mm-hmm. So I think you could have half fans and then half be sports writers or other players in the players, league. Yeah, players would be a good thing to have, I, like I think. Them. Or you could just do players and then management. Mm-hmm. 50 fit. Mm-hmm. Like, you take the best of what the players voted and what management votes. Yeah. And I go mean, from there. I mean, how is it fair to guys like Josh Donaldson, who's having oh, a fantastic year, so, but yep. he's not going to start the All-Star game yeah, because as as Mike should. Moustakis is going to have the most votes. Mm-hmm. That's, I don't know. Maybe you can have fans vote in players. Like, yeah. you know how they do, like, the blast vote? Yeah. And yeah, maybe yeah, you can yeah. vote, like, you know, reserves. Mm-hmm. But... To have the starters of the All-Star game be voted by fans, and, you know, I'm surprised this is happening with Kansas City, unlike, you know, like, people with New York. Yeah. Like, a big market squad. I know they have two teams there, but, you know. Or Boston. Or Boston, like that. Yeah. Like, I'm just surprised this is, you know, really happening just, you know, I know it's happened in the past where mm-hmm. multiple people that may have not deserved to be an All-Star starter, but, you know, this is in a larger magnitude. Like, you almost have a full team of yeah. Royals to- going out there. They should just make it an exhibition game that doesn't have any effect on the real season. Um, oh, or they I could do it, where it's the players, fans vote in who gets there, but that's not for starting roles in a way mm. that they may want their seven players to do the home run contest yeah. or something like that. Yeah, they could have nice. the players decide who plays in the All-Star game and fans decide a separate squad that is out there for the fan portion of it where it's mm-hmm. the home run derby and all this other stuff where... Yeah. Maybe the fans could have a part in that. Who uh-huh. votes for the home run derby compared to the other part? I think it's just hilarious. Like, obviously, it, it sucks for guys that deserve to be in and aren't going to get in. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's imagine that. It's going to be so funny to see the seven Royals trot out there in the All-Star game. Yeah. I'm excited. Last thing I want to talk about is we're approaching halfway through the season. And just looking over the league, what do you th- who do you think is going to make the playoffs right now? Makes the playoffs? Or the- <sighs> yeah, wild card. We don't, I mean, we don't have to go through every play. We don't have to go through everyone. But, you know, big teams, you know, I think the Cardinals are obviously. I think right. they're at this point a lock. I feel like Cardinals I mean, almost all the way. They'll yeah, eventually get players back, and they're going to be a really hard team to beat, even going into the playoffs. So Okay, so Pirates here, right it. now, pick an AL contender for the World Series. For the World Series? Oh, that's really well, tough. You, if you think St. Louis is going to go all the way, what's the point? Uh, in the no, AL. I think they get just to the final. Pirates will put them up for their money. I don't know about uh, that. The Pirates will put them up for the, their money, but they won't win. <laughs> the Pirates, you know, you can make the same argument with the Pirates as the same for the Twins. They've been kind of streaky this year. I mean, when the Twins went to the Pirates, they were playing terrible baseball. And now they're playing good. I mean, it's, well, it's yeah, almost Andrew an He always does that. You know, he starts off slow, and then he becomes an MVP caliber player. You know, I'll, I'll, let's annoying. just do this. Let's pick the conference finals for each of them, the two teams. I'm picking Dodgers versus Cardinals for the NL. I'll take Nationals, Cardinals. I'll also go with Nationals and Cardinals. I like the Nationals, Cardinals, I do. Too. I, really, I like I really the Dodgers. Well. Okay, if you guys are going to say Nationals, Cardinals, I'll take the Pirates to make it. Screw the Cardinals. They're there every year. Let's get some new blood. I we, I wish that would happen. Let's, see, but, the, you let's know. see the Pirates. Let's see. The and then AL. That's do you really pick? Tough. It's hard because are the Astros going to be a fluke team that and fall off I, after the All Star? How pick? can how can you say that? 
No, okay, yeah. I, honestly, never mind. I'm saying they could be just like us. Okay, and also I'll, I'll, I'll pull the Drew on this and say no, like, but it's but it's different. They keep winning. The Astros have a distinct playing style, which is basically try to hit a home run. If you strike out, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they <laughs> well, just start bombing the. Base I look at the now. NL. There's multiple teams there that almost have like it's almost like the Spurs in the NBA. Like they have a playoff strategy. Mm-hmm. But you look through the AL. There's it's, not a lot. There's almost no teams that I really have a playoff. Right. You know, run. You got the Rays out. in the first in the East, the Royals, and then the Astros. And then you look at the East. The East is a weak division this year, mm-hmm. which is not usually. You don't usually yeah. say that, but yeah. this year they have not been, you know, top. I mean, of course, the Tampa Bay Rays. They've been they have forty one runs. I think the right Orioles now. pull it out for that. I think they come out. That's of there, an interesting but, pick, right? But there. I don't think they make it to the final. I mean, Adam Jones. Point. They're talking about putting him on the DL, so that might. That that's hurts. something. True. I kind of like the Blue Jays to come out of there. Do you pick the Royals? Ooh. The Blue Jays are the best yeah. hitting team in baseball, I yeah, think, at this I moment. Think the Blue Jays are good. But the East is very close, given it's a weak one, but then the Red Sox are kind of... And then you look at the hungry. Kansas City Royals. They're hungry, though. They, they want to get back to that World Series. Like They feel like that's, they almost lost that World Series they, in that game seven. This whole season, they've talked about feeling disrespected. And I know we hit on it on an earlier episode of the Rush Hour, how we talked about how they were fighting with everybody. They, they obviously do have that hunger and that drive to prove that last year was not a fluke. Speaking of which, they're playing the Athletics this week. The Athletics. This is going to be a fun oh, series dear. to watch. Oh, boy. Oh boy. <laughs> three breaths cleaning brawls is, in three is, games. Is Brett Lowry going to die in this series? <laughs> he could potentially. All right, but who are your picks for the AL? Because it's Dude, really tough. Screw it. Astros World Series versus oh Nationals. My. Wow. Screw it. Uh, and Astros win. And Whoa. everyone is happy. Wow. And Astros win. And the MLB. If you say the Astros, Astros go from the worst <laughs> team of the league to the best like If that. you say the Astros win Red the Sox World Sox Series, wins. the Twins can make it to the playoffs. <laughs> No, I. Uh, I think Twins are a wild card, but um, in, in all honesty, I think the Angels are probably the most talented. I team think, yeah, in America. I think Angels, Royals. In the, yeah. I think it, Trout, he learned from last year getting swept by the Royals. I think he's gonna be more of a leader in that clubhouse going I'd into like the playoffs. So I think the Angels, Royals, fine. And I don't know about the Royals. I, you know, the Tigers have a really good hitting team, and they're just. I think they're just cold right now. I mean. Yeah, and but they, it's a possibility they've lost they a lot in the pitching department. And that experience. the Detroit Tigers bullpen is not that great. That's something that might hurt them in, if they the, make it to the playoffs. And the bullpen is something that's always underrated, especially going to the playoffs. Oh, yeah. And it's so crucial. It's I so mean, crucial. that's something that the Royals have, though. They have the best bullpen in the AL, probably without a doubt. And I, either one of the Mariners or Indians, I believe, will still make the playoffs. I was high on those teams coming into the season. The Mariners. They're both, they're both struggling. They're both struggling. Yeah. I think talent will eventually win out with those two. One of them, I think, will make it. Mm-hmm. If I had to pick one, I'd say Mariners, because they don't have to get over the Rangers in the athletics. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, it was fun today. Uh, quick on deck for tonight, you got the Women's World Cup, USA versus China at 6.30. Playing with two players down shouldn't be a problem. Uh, also got the NHL draft tonight, too. So tune into that. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Drew. Thank See you, you next week, guys. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg.